When you invite a friend to introduce you, they steal your thunder here. I was getting ready to start with Proverbs 19.2. It is not good to have zeal without knowledge. It's not good for air traffic controllers to have zeal without knowledge, nor to be hasty and miss the way. It's not good for surgeons to have zeal without knowledge. It's not good for pastors. It's not good for missionaries. It's not good for Bible translators to have zeal without knowledge. To me, the joy is to be in a room this size of people whose very life commitments is to combine knowledge and zeal, zeal for God and his purposes in the world. That is to be in a room with the kinds of uh, uh, energies that is there on behalf of this. Spend the time looking through the program. 130 or 140 people have spent a lot of time to prepare for this conference, working very hard on uh, presentations. One whole track will focus on issues related uh, to worship. There will be another whole track focused on issues related to short-term missions, uh, sister church partnerships and so on, third wave mission. In the last few years I've watched and been partially involved in a group of scholars from across Africa, uh, from Fateb, Bangui, uh, Stellenbosch, uh, Daystar, Negest, uh, et, so, uh, et cetera, uh, top African professors, scholars, doing research uh, on African leadership, a group that together surveyed 8,400 Christians in three countries, in four languages, English, Swahili, French, Portuguese, so uh, in, in Kenya, Angola, Central African Republic, and again, uh, uh, there will be one whole track that is simply focused on what has been a several year uh, project uh, working on uh, studying issues related to African Christian leadership. Spend the time to look at what's in there. There's isolated, uh, you can find papers on uh, Boko Haram. Uh, you can find papers comparing uh, the preaching of, of Rob Bell and Tim Keller and Father Flager. Uh, etc. So there's a, there's a lot in there. The program that we have uh, as the ASM has been reinventing itself the last three or four years rather than a very few presentations in one room everyone uh, sitting uh, and listening we have created a space for a lot of uh, presentations. Part of what this means is and short presentations for the most part. A few exceptions that are still uh, part of the old tradition uh, that I will take advantage of here. Um, <laughs> uh, but there's, uh, these are short presentations in those 25 minute blocks of time essentially. Uh, presenters should know that in prior years people gave really good feedback for people who spent 20 minutes presenting and gave five minutes for people to ask questions and make comments so you should uh, take that to heart if you want some good evaluations. Um, the, you are not obligated to stick with any one track. I mean, we're hoping that people will have interests and that many people will stay over time in a certain area. But many of you will know somebody in another track and you'll be moving back and forth. The rooms are in two buildings, the Billy Graham Center, and then as you go out the front into that middle grassy area to the left is the other building. So you'll want to look at the maps which are in your program and study those uh, carefully. There is one room change that you need to be aware of, track three. There will be a sign at the old room and it will just be moving you down three rooms, but track three uh, will change from uh, 11 1,114 to 1,136. Uh, 1,114 to 1,136. Track three, if you want to look at that. I would like to also thank, before I start, a lot of people who've put in a huge amount of work. Two people in particular that have helped me enormously have been Greg Leffel and Patricia Fenrick, uh, without which this conference would not have been possible uh, this year. And then also there have been uh, this year, we probably have more, we certainly have a broad representation of people coming from Africa and distant places, 
and some of those people were able to join us because there were other folks that helped provide some of the cost to that. So Scholar Leaders International, the PCUSA, the Tyndale uh, Foundation, uh, Mary Klein, Yaling, Edward Elliott on the, on the board that have played such a pivotal role in the Africa Leadership Project I mentioned earlier. So thank you uh, to all of you. If you are a student, one of the things that you should appreciate about a professional meeting is that people present their materials before it's in print in order to give people a chance to tell them what's wrong with what they've done, what needs to be modified, corrected, uh, etc. Uh, so when we present, the, the ideal is not just to present and say take it or leave it, but to give people a chance uh, to respond. So there will be a few minutes towards the end of our time tonight uh, for people to make comments or provide uh, response. And my goal is to mix it up enough that there'll be some people wanting to respond. On a Sunday morning, several years ago, Americans opened their newspapers to see a Parade magazine interview with the former president of the University of Northwestern, Dr. Billy Graham. When asked, do you have any regrets, he replied, yes. I wish I had studied more. I wish I had gotten a PhD in anthropology. <laughs> What a remarkable regret. <clears throat> Graham himself majored in anthropology at Wheaton College because he was interested in being a missionary. Anthropology was a popular major in his time for Wheaton students planning to be missionaries. Many missiologists in that era were narrowly fixated on sociological who questions. Who does the evangelism? Who pays the bills? Who calls the shots? And of course later, who does the theological education, the theologizing. If it was local people doing each of these, then the church was said to be indigenous, even if local Christians and their churches were culturally conflicted and foreign. But Wheaton College students planning to be missionaries majored in anthropology under accomplished professors like Dr. Gregolia. They called themselves culture vultures and made cultural considerations in service of Christian mission a central concern. Summers for many involved traveling to Norman, Oklahoma, to study linguistics and anthropology under famous missionary scholars like Ken Pike and Eugene Nida. Wheaton graduates such as Marvin Mayers, Charles Kraft, Sherwood Lingenfelter, Miriam Adeney, I think she's here somewhere, went on to have notable careers as missiological anthropologists either doing their doctoral work in standard anthropology departments or, like Kraft, going to the Kennedy School of Missions at Hartford Seminary where they could do doctoral work under noted linguists such as William Wellmers, William J. Samarin, Al Gleason, sociologists like Peter Berger, and anthropologists like Absalom Vilikasi, Paul Lesser, Morris Stegerda, and Edwin Smith. In 1953, Robert Taylor, a Wheaton College anthropology professor, founded a journal, Practical Anthropology intended to demonstrate the value of anthropology for missionary practice, a journal subsequently edited by Eugene Nida of the American Bible Society. A team of linguist anthropologists, including Kraft, Jacob Lowen, Marie Fetzer Rayburn, William Rayburn, William Smalley, Charles Tabor, and William Wanderley, led by Eugene Nida, formed an invisible college of missiological anthropologists communicating closely with each other, reading and providing feedback on each other's work, consulting with field missionaries, and filling the pages of practical anthropology with field-based and practically oriented anthropological articles for field missionaries. As a result, there was an explosion of interest in anthropology by field missionaries with thousands subscribing to the journal. My own parents, Bible college graduates, made their summer pilgrimages along with hundreds of other young people to Norman, Oklahoma to study with Ken Pike. And as missionaries, my parents each, before I was even born, published articles in the flagship journal, The American Anthropologist, which I haven't done myself. From its beginnings in the mid-1960s, Fuller's School of World Mission, capitalizing on the interest in anthropology that the journal Practical Anthropology had inspired among field missionaries, and following the earlier lead of the Kennedy School of Missions at Hartford, hired anthropology faculty, Alan Tippett, Ralph Winner, Charles Kraft, Paul Hebert, Daniel Shaw, Sherwood Lingenfelter, with other seminaries such as Asbury, Whiteman, Rinkowicz, Iberola, and now Sue Russell, and Trinity, Hebert, and uh, myself, following Fuller's lead. 
At one level, this has been foundational to the development of American missiology. Raise your hand if you studied at one of these three schools taking classes with one or more of the above anthropologists. Others of you doubtless studied under Louis Lusbatak or Tony Gittens, Enoch Wan or Miriam Aideney, Marvin Mayers or Douglas Penoyer, or any of numerous other missiological anthropologists active in earlier decades. Unlike in Europe, anthropology historically played a central role in American missiology, bringing the concern with culture and human context to the center of missiological scholarship, with a high proportion of American missiologists having acquired anthropological understandings and skills. In the 1970s, there was a shift in missiological vocabulary from indigeneity, which fixated narrowly on who questions, to contextualization, which made cultural dynamics a more central concern. But this vocabulary shift long post-dated the actual shift to a culture focus exemplified during the preceding two decades in the pages of practical anthropology. 1973 marked the founding of the American Society of Missiology. You need to buy the new book over there on the history of the ASM. An important milestone in the institutionalization of missiology departments within American theological education. The American Society of Missiology took over the journal Practical Anthropology and rebranded it Missiology, an international review. Its first editor, Alan Tippett, was an anthropologist, but his social location was that of seminary professor. The very name missiology located the field as a subset of theological studies, and over the years, six out of seven editors of the renamed journal were seminary professors. Missiology was a discipline that integrated anthropology with other theological disciplines towards the end that Christian mission be wisely and effectively carried out. This created an expanded space for missiological anthropology within theological education and helped introduce thousands of missionaries and missiologists to anthropology. And the very fact that I, an anthropologist, speak to you this year as president of the ASM might seem to signal the ongoing institutionalized centrality of anthropology to American missiology. But matters are probably not what they seem. A couple years ago, Daryl Whiteman introduced me at the ASM as the youngest anthropologist he was aware of in any missiology program. <laughs> in the last weeks, as I visited doctors' offices repeatedly for help <laughs> with what initially was diagnosed as gout, it's dawned on me that maybe Daryl wasn't complimenting me on how youthful I am, but rather was sounding a warning about the gout-ridden state of anthropology within <laughs> missiological institutions. <clears throat> In line with Daryl's concern, we might note that recent textbook introductions to missiology increasingly warn of the dangers of social science influence within missiology at the very time when social science is less curricularly present in our missiology programs than ever before. And they tell the story of missiology while largely eliminating anthropology and anthropologists like Nida, Tippett, Kraft, and Hebert from the story. As the last three anthropologists, Kraft, Lingenfelter, and Shaw, retire at Fuller, America's flagship missiology program, and as Fuller currently discusses a possible future with no anthropology faculty in its missiology program, reassessing where we are with anthropology would seem in order. At one level, missiology's increasing disconnect with anthropology is startling, giving the emerging and exciting focus on Christianity within anthropology today, led by wonderful scholars like Joel Robbins, or Marla Frederick, uh, who we'll hear from tomorrow, a Harvard professor. Never before has there been a time when the potential overlap of anthropological and missiological research and writing interests have been greater, and yet at no time in the last 60 years has the future of missiological engagement with anthropology looked more bleak. There are doubtless many reasons for this. Let me briefly discuss one. The social location of missiology within theological institutions exposes missiology to the pervasive preference by theologians for interdisciplinary interactions with the humanities and against the social sciences. Consider the pattern as exemplified in a non-theologian, the philologist C.S. Lewis. The hero of Lewis's science fiction is the philologist Ransom, while the wimpy sociologist Mark Studdock is mocked for false pretensions to knowledge and insight. 
Lewis's fictional demon, Screwtape, tells his demon nephew, Wormwood, that students should be kept away from the physical sciences because the physical sciences might lead them to God, but that if they wish to study, they should be encouraged to study sociology, a discipline <laughs> presumably firmly in the devil's camp. <laughs> <laughs> Consider theologian Alistair McGrath in his 2001 Scientific Theology. He points out that historically theologians made philosophy their dialogue partner, their ancilla theologia, and sets forth his own proposal to make the physical sciences serve as a new dialogue partner for theologians, an ancilla theologia nova. But in a several page disquisition, McGrath insists that the social sciences must not be allowed to play such a dialogue partner role. McGrath is not an outlier. The pattern is long-term, but in recent decades has intensified under the influence of John Milbank's egregious misrepresentations of social science, as well as the influence of Stanley Hauerwas and others who, like C.S. Lewis, locate social science in the devil's camp. The result is that even when theologians choose to focus on topics that are the bread and butter of anthropological and sociological research and writing, such as in Miroslav Volf's otherwise wonderful book, Exclusion and Embrace, it is Nietzsche and Derrida that Wolf interacts with, not the anthropologists and sociologists who've actually empirically studied ethnicity, caste, racial categorization, redlining, and so on. The social sciences in the minds of many theologians should not be allowed a dialogue partner role. And this unfortunately influences the environment in which missiology must justify its own existence. Some of you will remember our ASM meetings a decade ago where we were invited to consider missiology's relations with key disciplines. For his history, two historians, Dana Robert and Jehu Hansel, described as how, as historians, they interface with and contribute to missiology. But for anthropology, rather than hear in a parallel fashion from missiological anthropologists, we heard from a radical orthodoxy theologian who told us that anthropology had no legitimate place within missiology. Daryl Whiteman and I were allowed short responses, but had to focus our energies rebutting attacks and their right to exist, rather than positively spelling out how as anthropologists we interface with and contribute to missiology. In the last few years at the ASM, we've reflected on the state and future of our discipline from a number of vantage points. Last year, Dana Robert provided a wonderful overview from the vantage point of a historian. Since no one spoke of the history and, or the state and future of missiology from the perspective of anthropology, I figured I would use my platform here today to put this in front of us. As part of this, I worked to ensure that our ASM program this year would feature a variety of contemporary anthropologists, from Marla Frederick of Harvard to Brian Howell of Wheaton College, Fran Costarellis of Governor's State, Stevie Barola, and so on. And you can find others, Aidney, Russell, Rinkowitz, Shaw, Whiteman, uh, please be nice to them. Uh, <laughs> Let me hasten to clarify that I'm not primarily concerned with whether anthropologists get hired in missiology departments, or even with whether I turn out to be the last anthropologist to serve as president of ASM, although naturally I would be horrified if I thought this were going to be true. My, my concern, rather, is with missiology's relationship to the strength that anthropology represents. Anthropology represents a sustained focus through high quality empirical research on understanding contemporary human sociocultural realities in all the variable contexts in which people live and in which ministry is carried out. Many of you in this room tonight with PhDs in missiology or intercultural studies exemplify in your own life and work such a strong and sustained empirical focus on contemporary human realities. You do so, many of you, in part because the anthropological has been part of your own formation and training. This is an important strength of American missiology at its best, a strength I believe should be nurtured, valued, and protected. Of course, in the modern world, older cultural patterns related to relatively bounded ethno-linguistic groups have been transformed into new patterns involving global flows, hybridities, and new cultural formations. Thus, it becomes very important that our understanding of sociocultural dynamics are grounded in the contemporary world, not some imagined or idealized past. This is as important to remember in Africa as in America. However, 
Some people imagine that new globalizing patterns create a global cultural homogeneity where everyone may be presumed to share a single culture and thus where the strengths of anthropology are no longer needed. Such people assume that theological education in Nairobi, Hong Kong, and Chicago need not differ since such education prepares people for ministry where context no longer varies. But in fact, our world continues to exemplify new and variable sociocultural dynamics that continue to challenge us with how wisely to live out Christian witness and faith within diverse contexts. Missiology at its best calls for interdisciplinary engagement with contextual realities, with anthropological strengths, an essential, but uh, only a part of this engagement. That is, a healthy missiology will not pit the theological and anthropological or historical in opposition to each other, but will allow each to contribute strategic strengths to the task. In the remainder of my time, rather than justify in purely theoretical terms the importance of a missiology that integrates the anthropological with the theological, I thought I would illustrate the contemporary relevance of such an approach by focusing on an old anthropological topic that continues to pose difficult challenges for contemporary Christian response, the topic of witchcraft. Indeed, over the next day and a half, one track will be devoted to this topic. I see myself in this plenary as introducing this track and the issues at stake while simultaneously highlighting the limits of, of a theology divorced from anthropological understandings. A couple years ago, Reverend Baswa, and I'm using a pseudonym here, of Congo told me a story while showing me an accompanying homemade film of the key events. Baswa's older relative, Zuzi, an elder in a Methodist church, had in more prosperous times paid for Baswa's theological education. But Zuzi and his family had experienced financial setbacks, chronic illness, and family deaths, and Zuzi's remaining family showed up at Baswa's home seeking shelter and help. Soon, Susie's children told Baswa that they wondered if their family's mysterious financial problems, health problems, and deaths might be due to a witch, and that some people thought Zuzi was the witch causing all this. While they knew Reverend Baswa would be opposed to consulting a non-Christian diviner, they wondered if he was willing for them to consult a Christian prophet. Baswa agreed, and a prophet was called. Zuzi, who, like me, suffered from pain in one foot, was misled into believing the prophet had come to treat his foot. The prophet told him he had a needle in his leg that needed to be removed. As an aside, my doctor asked me a few weeks ago if the pain in my foot felt like a needle piercing me. I, I, I said yes. <clears throat> the prophet asked Zuzi if he could feel the needle in his leg. Yes, he could. And so with everything on film, the prophet proceeded to cut a hole two inches in diameter in the bottom of Zuzi's foot. Zuzi stoically endured. And then from the cloth being pressed against the wound, a burst of smoke erupted. And when the cloth was removed, a needle was seen sticking out of the hole in his foot. The prophet then poured olive oil in one corner of the room with smoke rising from the oil. All of this I see on film, right? And he picked up a tooth. Also on the film were two serious burns on Zuzi's upper back. Reverend Basso explained that the Christian prophet had probed Zuzi's back, and from two spots, flames had spewed forth, but died out before filming could restart. All this time, Zuzi's participation in this painful process was based on his belief that he was being treated as a victim of witchcraft. But at the end of the session, the prophet pronounced, Zuzi, the powerful witch who killed people with the needle in his foot, who ate people with his witch tooth, and who traveled overnight supernaturally to distant places like Europe, propelled by the jet engines in his back. <laughs> the prophet claimed to have removed Zuzi's witch power. When anthropologists studied cultures around the world, they learned that in a small number of societies, as in the book of Job, the wise counselors, the shamans, the diviners, the prophets of the culture told people that their afflictions were based on a karmic logic of punishment for their own sin. Much more commonly, anthropologists found societies where the wise counselors attributed misfortune, infertility, illness, economic setbacks, death to a neighbor, relative, or colleague thought secretly to cause harm through a mysterious and malevolent power. While societies like Job's asked, what did you do to deserve this? These other societies asked, who did this to you? 
Some of these societies treated the malevolent powers magical, involving acquired skills and manipulating words, such as in curses, or manipulating objects like voodoo dolls or graveyard dirt. Others conceived the power as psychic, simply an inborn power requiring no verbal conjurations or manipulation of physical substances, and yet others as tied to spirits and their powers. In some societies, like the Aguaruna of Peru, where I live, only men were accused of killing through witchcraft. In others, it was largely elderly widows, and yet others, like the Ashaninka of Peru, it was mainly orphaned children, and especially little girls. A wide variety of ideologies explain their supposed powers, although in pre-Christian societies this was virtually never associated with a supernatural Satan figure. In many societies, people said that witches did not even know they were witches, with their malevolent power operating unconsciously to bring harm to others. In others, the power was thought to operate through socially learned and manipulated magical technique. What the culture shared in common was the pattern of attributing misfortune, infertility, economic problems, deaths, health problems, to other neighbors, relatives, or colleagues like thought to have caused these misfortunes through mysterious and powerful evil. The word witch is like the word football. For Americans, football refers to a sport where a funny looking ball is carried and thrown by hands. What everybody else in the world calls football, since the ball is guided by the foot, <laughs> Americans insist on calling soccer. Conversations about football can be hilarious when two people don't understand that even though they're using the exact same word, they're talking about two completely different realities. A similar issue arises with words witch and witchcraft. For some, these terms reference shamans, diviners, or traditional healers. But in most societies, words that anthropologists translate as shaman, diviner, or traditional healer, in Swahili we might say Ganga, are lexically differentiated from a completely different category of persons thought to exercise malevolent, evil, supernatural power to harm relatives, colleagues, and neighbors. It's the latter concept, in Swahili and Chawi, that anthropologists translate as witch or sorcerer. In our case, it is Zuzi, not the prophet, who's accused of being a witch. For some, in the West, the word witch or witchcraft brings to mind something else, new forms of neo-paganism or Wicca, often with feminist and ecological values, and where the core ethical principle is said to be, first, do no harm. But while Wiccans are certainly free to call themselves witches, which they do, just as Americans are free to call their sport football, I focus tonight on a usage just spelled out that is much more common worldwide. If you attend the witch track, you may learn from Steve Rasmussen about scores of elderly widows among the Sakuma of Tanzania hacked to death with machetes each year after being blamed for secretly murdering others through witchcraft. Kwabena Samoa Gyadu may reference the witch camps of Ghana, so powerfully portrayed in Yaba Bado's award-winning film, The Witches of Gambaga, witch camps where hundreds of women have fled for their lives against the charge that they've harmed people through witchcraft. Or perhaps you'll hear Mulumba Mukundi describe the relatively new phenomenon now prevalent from Nigeria to Congo, Angola, or Malawi, where orphan boys and girls, often four to eight years old, are accused of having caused their parents' death through witchcraft. Again, you may learn from Zach's Gea that pastors not infrequently become the object of accusations that they are witches. From Timothy Nyasulu, you may learn of the large number of Presbyterian church members in Malawi who undergo church discipline for consulting diviners trying to figure out who has bewitched them, since their Presbyterian pastor doesn't know how to tell them that. Every <laughs> Every speaker in this track will report on which realities, not from ancient history, but from our contemporary world. A couple of years ago, I was invited to speak in chapel on witchcraft at the Nairobi Evangelical Graduate School of Theology. I reluctantly agreed to do so on the condition that I could first survey the seminarians there. In the survey, I asked if people had ever had a relative, colleague, or neighbor that others had accused of having killed someone through witchcraft. More than 80% of the 161 respondents said yes, with one out of 10 saying, I've got 10 or more family members or neighbors who've been accused of killing through witchcraft. In one seminary in the Congo, Tim Stabel, who will also present, reported that 100% of respondents said yes, they had neighbors or family members accused of murdering through witchcraft. In a follow-up survey in Kenya of another group of theologians and seminarians, 95% said they had had people tell them that they suspected their health problems were due to a witch, with two-thirds saying at least 20 people have told me this. 
Nearly two-thirds reported that someone had told them they suspected their infertility was caused by a witch. Similarly, 91% reported that people had told them their financial problems were due to malevolent witches. The same 91% said people had reported the death of a family member as caused by a witch, with a quarter of respondents saying at least 20 people had told them some family death was caused by a witch. When I asked people who, re who reported personally knowing someone accused of being a witch, what had happened to the accused, 90% said they were shunned and avoided. 70% said they were verbally attacked or mocked. 68% they were beaten up and physically attacked. 53% they were driven out of home and community. 50% their property taken and destroyed. 32% said they were killed. Of course, these are people they know, right? Of course, since it is often widows and orphans being accused, even the milder consequence of being shunned and, and avoided is terribly consequential, as John Jusu's presentation will likely make clear. Before I spoke at Negus, I surveyed a group of 50 American seminarians in a New Testament course at Trinity with the same exact questions. Only two American students, 4%, reported ever hearing anyone attribute a misfortune or death to the witchcraft of a relative, neighbor, or colleague. And one of them wrote a note on the side of the questionnaire saying it was while I was a missionary in North India. <laughs> when wanting to survey American seminarians, I asked a systematic theology professor who was teaching a course on the problem of evil if he would be willing to administer my survey to his students. I suggested I could give him the comparative results of American versus Kenyan, uh, et cetera, seminarians, and that this would create a natural conversation for his course, given its focus. The theologian looked at me with sheer bafflement <laughs> and said, my course isn't concerned with things like that. This is the course in the problem of evil. Despite having taught and supervised actual students from around the world, this professor could not imagine that the problem of evil might require a different set of concerns and conversation partners than he was used to. While seminarians in America, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria are intellectually gifted, sophisticated, will have read many of the same authors, the mix of pastoral challenges and existential questions faced in contemporary Nigeria or the DRC will vary significantly from the mix of pastoral challenges and questions that most American pastors regularly face, and nowhere more so than in our topic tonight. And it is missiology, with its incorporation of anthropological concerns and tools for understanding variable sociocultural dynamics that helps connect the theological with the grassroots experiential realities around the world that need to be understood and engaged. Missiology at its best values the interdisciplinary, positively valuing linguistics, anthropology, history, biblical studies, theology, and so on, while allowing the strengths of each to inform the others through the right sorts of healthy integration. What does an, such an integrative approach look like? There are two issues. One concerns the various disciplines that ought to inform the conversation, and the second concerns how the various disciplinary strengths ought to be brought into connection with each other. Take history as an example, as a discipline. Between 1450 and 1770, Europeans attributed many misfortunes to the agency of witches, with European courts jailing and prosecuting roughly 90,000 people as witches and executing roughly 45,000 of them. As with our own famous case in Salem, Massachusetts, the historical records are often incredibly detailed and rich, allowing for sophisticated analyses by historians. This judicially exercised violence was often more systematically extreme than much of the extrajudicial violence exercised today in places like um, New Guinea, Northern Peru, where I was, South Africa, although you can find uh, such forms of violence at similar levels sometimes. But the parallels from European history with what is happening in New Guinea Parts of Asia, Latin America, and various regions of Africa today are numerous. In European history, one finds children accused of being witches. As with Dorcas Good in Salem, identified as a witch and thrown in jail for eight months at the mature age of four. One finds pastors accused and killed, as with George Burroughs, also of Salem. One finds the testimony of accusing children playing central roles, as it did in Salem. 
One finds confession elicited under questionable social pressures being appealed mm -hmm. to as definitive proof. One finds appeals to a wide variety of folk beliefs about moles, witches' teats, or whiskers on women as evidence that someone is a witch. One finds pastoral authorities playing key roles in accrediting the accusations, just as with Cotton Mather, or the Christian prophet referenced earlier. An odd thing happened historically in Europe and North America that historians can't quite make sense of. Although one can find contemporary Americans and Europeans espousing astrology, reincarnation, New Age channeling, spiritism, belief in Bigfoot, a wide variety of forms of neo-paganism, the idea that one person's misfortunes might have been supernaturally caused by another person acting through witchcraft was largely abandoned more than two centuries ago. Well, I have some theories on this historic shift here. What I want to point out is this. Although Western theologians are quite aware of the history of witch accusations in Europe, this is treated as an idiosyncrasy from the distant past, not as posing compelling pastoral questions that require serious theological response today. Even church historians who necessarily touch on this history minimally engage the broader theological questions and fail to explore links between such a distant European past and what is playing out in places like New Guinea today. In short, these historians with specialized expertise in the topic are unlikely purely as historians to engage in the interdisciplinary conversations that missiology calls for and fosters. Missiology invites historians to bring all their specialized knowledge into a sustained, integrative conversation with theologians, anthropologists, and field missionaries, field practitioners. Or consider biblical studies. While biblical scholars know a great deal about biblical languages and contexts, they often fail to understand critical anthropological distinctions between two families of terms. One set of terms for the claimed identities of those exercising power to heal, divine the future, or impress others, shamans, diviners, traditional healers, wonder workers, prophets. And a second set of terms related to our English words witch or sorcerer for those thought to secretly be the cause of other people's misfortunes. When the woman at Endor is referred to as using, uh, uh, referred to in translation, using indigenous words for secret killer, which, this is a mistranslation. Her identity was not a secret killer, but a diviner, someone consulting the dead on behalf of the living. In Israel, this was understood as wrong, but it was a different wrong from that of murder. In Acts, when the Greek word magus is applied to Elemis or Simon, and translators select words from African languages, I have a whole battery of these examples I've collected, words that mean sorcerer, witch, secret killer, to translate such passages, these translations misconstrue the nature of the identities of Simon and Elemis. Interestingly, none of those translations using those terms, labeling Elemis a witch, are used to indicate that the men bringing gifts to the child Jesus were witches or sorcerers, although it's the same Greek word in both cases. <laughs> Perhaps more difficult is the Exodus 22:18 passage, you shall not allow a kashaf to live. As translated into languages across many parts of the world, certainly much of Africa, but not the language of Northeast Asia, kashaf is translated with words meaning secret killer and is understood by readers as recognizing that there are secret killers in Jewish society that need to be ferreted out and put to death. Of course, the only two passages in the Old Testament where actual people are named as kashaf are in Exodus 7:11, where Pharaoh calls for his kashaf, his religious professionals, to perform amazing deeds, and Daniel 2:2, where Nebuchadnezzar calls for his kashaf, his religious professionals, to divine the dream. In both settings, the context is that is not that of Mchawi, secret killer, but of people involved in magical and/or religious practices similar to that of the Mganga. The word kashaf in Korean is translated mudang or baksu, shaman. And no Korean understands the passage to be a warning about secret killers that need to be ferreted out and killed. Interestingly, even the Septuagint translation of kashaf, pharmacus, does not entail the secret killer idea. Only later with the Vulgate's use of maleficos do we get the witch idea clearly introduced with 
consequences, I would argue, for European history. Or consider the challenge of translating the idea of Satan into languages where there is no historic image of Satan, but rather where the discursive focus of evil is the image of a human being, a witch. In such context, words for evil are witch-inflected, every word the translator draws from. In the extreme, as with the Ewe of Ghana, the very word missionaries used for Satan, Abun Sam, is an Akan term understood by Ewe as a synonym for witch. So every time you see the word Satan, you know there's witches around. One finds the interesting situation where Koreans and Ewe read completely different Bibles. Koreans read a Bible where no secret occult killers exist in their text, while Ewe read a Bible permeated by the witch idea. Bible translators desperately need to be informed, not only by conversations with biblical scholars, but also with the broader integrative and anthropologically informed conversations that missiology fosters. Anthropologists like Richard Schwader indicate that some societies, like that of Job's comforters, systematically articulate a moral causal ontology, where every misfortune is due to one's own sin, maybe in an earlier reincarnation, earlier life. In such societies, one does not imagine that secret human killers around you are causing your misfortune. But other societies operate with interpersonal causal ontologies, where other evil persons are understood as causing the misfortune. In which societies there are special words for those secret killers and misfortunes, such as infertility, sickness, poverty, or death, will then trigger a quest to identify who the evil person was causing the harm. Not surprisingly, people thought of as murderers are not treated kindly. And it, in such societies, Christians pray regularly for God to protect them from witches, something Korean and contemporary American Christians don't usually do. Here is one part of our challenge. Our Bible appears to have been given against a cultural backdrop where biases were much more towards the moral causal ontology ideology than the interpersonal one. Even though the Bible is filled with references to misfortune, infertility, economic crisis, illness and death, there is not a single instance anywhere in the Bible that any person attributes any misfortune to another human being thought to have caused the misfortune by means of evil supernatural power. Nowhere in the biblical narrative does misfortune trigger a quest to ferret out and prosecute the supposed witches. Even though the Bible is filled with prayers, no one prays that God will protect them from a witch or sorcerer. That is, the Bible involves a sustained dialogue with the cultural ideologies of Job's counselors, which makes it easy to apply biblical teaching in contexts where people have those same cultural ideologies. But since Job's comforters did not espouse the witch idea, we simply do not have, certainly in the book of Job, and I would answer elsewhere, scripture systematically addressing the belief that certain people's misfortunes are caused by other people using evil supernatural means. I'm not saying that what scripture tells us is insufficient to address the questions, but simply that the task of theological contextual reflection is much more difficult because of the distance between the cultural settings in which scripture is given and the settings in which which ideas are normative. Such contextual reflection is even less likely when theological scholars are located in societies where which ideas are not experienced as present or compelling. Scripture, of course, does teach the reality of demonic powers. And the very idea of demonic or satanic power does force new considerations when which ideas are in view. Which is not to say that biblical demonology is ever formally linked by scripture to the witch idea. And nowhere does scripture ever directly address the question of whether certain people really are the co supernatural cause of other people's infertility, poverty, or death. Let me return to Zuzi's story. Notice that in a Christian setting, a non-Christian diviner was not consulted although historically it was diviners who pronounced the truth about witches. Notice also that the Christian prophet has now taken over the space formerly occupied by the diviner with a similar message and role. In a recent survey where seminarians were asked about people they knew who were accused of being witches, they reported that pastors had more frequently played a key role in endorsing the accusation than diviners had. This wouldn't be true with the Sakuma, but in some regions it would. And indeed, there are reasons to believe that many Christian leaders and Christian institutions are today at the forefront of propagating the witch idea and the idea I'm particularly interested in, the idea of children as witches. In his own writings, Dr. Opoku Onyina has demonstrated that new witch demonologies, to use his phrase, have become prevalent in many churches. 
but he interestingly demonstrates that an important building block of the new witch demonologies are the writings of American and British spiritual warfare writers. On his telling of the story, unless we read and understand the writings of Kurt Koch, Derek Prince, Peter Wagner, and Rebecca Brown, we're missing half of what is influencing these new hybrid witch demonologies. Of course, we should also expose ourselves to the parallel writings of Emmanuel Eni or Daniel Olukoya. And as you can perhaps guess, in my view of Poco Onyina's writings, unlike some of the others just mentioned, positively exemplifies the interdisciplinary and integrative missiological sort of approach I'm calling for, attentive to anthropological, pastoral, and theological realities. This is a uh, man with a doctorate, I think, from Birmingham, uh, head of Pentecostal Association in Ghana. Uh, very interesting. Church of Pentecostal. Let's return to Reverend Baswa, Zuzi, and the Prophet. An anthropological approach is never satisfied only with belief, but is always interested in how belief plays out interactionally in social process. That is, an anthropologist does not fixate on beliefs about which needles, which teeth, or which jet engine enabling instant travel to Europe, and is not overly concerned with or unduly impressed by how to produce smoke on command, but is very interested in the social outcomes of all this. Let me identify four social outcomes of this event and others like it. Number one, the accused was adversely affected by the encounter. Prior to this, there had only been speculative whispers that Zuzi might be a witch. Now there was a dramatic and public certification that he was. Even his own words agreeing that he could feel a needle in his leg was later interpreted as a confession. And while the prophet claimed to remove the witch power, the prophet also warned that witches easily retrieve their power. And in fact, everyone assumed that Zuzi had done so. When I asked about Zuzi's current situation, I learned he now lives alone in a tiny hut, cut off completely from family and friends, with everyone deeply convinced he is a witch murderer. Let me state this bluntly. Any story about a pastoral intervention with witchcraft is incomplete unless it considers empirically the long-term consequences of the intervention in the life of the accused. As a positive contrast, one could explore the pastoral interventions in Yaba Bado's film, The Witches of Gambaga, where elderly accused witches actually are helped by Ghanaian church leaders. We don't have time to talk about that one. Outcome number two. The Christian leader claiming power to identify and deal with witchcraft, in this case the Christian prophet, gained great publicity and credibility through the performance with many new followers. The accredited power to identify witches in a world where witches are thought always to be present carries with it enormous prestige and influence. Number three, third outcome. Mainstream Christian leaders are shown in a poor light and marginalized. While Reverend Baswa's authority as guardian of orthodoxy was critical to giving the prophet a platform, the prophet's dramatized powers implicitly reflected invidiously on Reverend Baswa, who claimed no such powers. As Reverend Baswa commented whimsically to me, my seminary did not teach me how to get the needle out of the witch's leg. As we may hear from Samuel Quignop or Zach Skeia, even in Equa, a denomination that historically would not have espoused such an approach, pastors claiming the new powers create a crisis of authority for pastors in churches unable or unwilling to claim these powers and exercise these ministries. Outcome number four, the witch idea is, is accredited as a Christian idea. In earlier decades, in most of Africa, it was non-Christian diviners that were identifying individuals as witches and causing misfortune, but now it is Christian spokespersons and leaders. The result is that people encounter the witch idea on the lips of Christian leaders as a thoroughly Christian idea. The witch idea now comes with the cognitive authority of Christianity, with many contemporary Christians inclined, like John Wesley of an earlier era, to equate any disbelief in witches as tantamount to atheism. Whether the witch idea merits being considered a Christian idea, I think ought to be an open question, not presupposed, an open question for further discussion. Now let me end with two observations and a conclusion. One, to apply the term witch to someone is to accuse them of criminal harm. If the accusation is accepted as true, this has enormous consequences for the accused. 
Tomorrow we will hear from Samuel Queen Yap who will grapple with the epistemological issues involved. If an old woman has whiskers on her chin, is this evidence that she's a witch? If a chicken is killed and the way the chicken falls reveals that someone is a witch, should this be trusted? Even if someone confesses to witchcraft under social dynamics fostering such confession, should this be trusted? In America, we're learning that from genetic testing and the advocacy of the Innocence Project that many who confess to Chicago police under suspicious circumstances that they were murderers are in fact innocent. Is gossip a reliable source of information? Since Satan is a liar, it makes sense that a theologian like Dr. Quinhyap would be interested in possible ways in which falsehood and lies might inform and underpin the process. A second observation. Tomorrow, John Jusu is going to highlight the fact that when people accuse individuals of having harmed others through an amazing and evil power, the people supposedly exercising this incredible power are often, in fact, the most weak and vulnerable members of society, the elderly, widows, orphans, the poor, and strangers. And as John Jusu will also point out, interestingly, these are the very categories the Bible calls on us to have empathy and love for, to actively help the widow, the orphan, the poor, the stranger. But the witch diagnosis invites us to withdraw empathy and love, to imagine them not in the image of Jesus or an angel that we should care for, but in the image of the devil. Since the Bible identifies Satan as an accuser who sows discord and death, it is worth considering the possibility that Satan is active through the accusation itself, that Satan is active in the accusers rather than the accused just as happened with the death of Jesus. It is possible that the self-righteous accusers are the ones actually doing the work of the devil. In a classic article entitled The Dark Side of the Shaman, the anthropologist Michael Brown has suggested that anytime shamans or diviners have a diagnosis that attributes misfortunes to third parties who are secretly witches, such shamans and diviners are actually sowing discord and death. The shaman, in Michael Harner's analysis, claims to give life. But if you explore the social outcomes of the social process, they contribute to suspicion, discord, and retaliatory violence. I've always been struck that at one moment, Jesus attributes Peter's words to God. And a second later, Jesus indicates Peter's words are from the devil. Get behind me, Satan. That is, I've been struck by the possibility that even ministers and spokespersons for God, like Cotton Mather, might express ideas that are wonderfully of God, but that this does not preclude the possibility that the same persons might simultaneously and mistakenly express words that accomplish practically the work of the devil. For a pastor to declare a six-year-old orphan a witch responsible for his parents' death, as sometimes happens, is either an impressive ability to ferret out evil in the most unlikely of places, or it is to do the work of the devil inviting us to treat orphans the opposite of how God has told us we should. I chose this topic tonight partly because it happens to be what I'm working on at the moment in conversation with a whole group of others and I wanted to give you a glimpse of the sorts of things an anthropologically informed missiologist grapples with, bringing to the fore topics Western theologians would normally be unlikely to seriously consider. I want you to catch a glimmer of how missiological issues desperately need an integrative approach. I want you to recognize that the work of missiologists in combination with church leaders has the potential positively to inform the church in its witness in the modern world and positively to help in situations as with this topic where many thousands, orphans, widows, and elderly are identified as witches. That is, I hope to cast a vision for missiology at its best being consequential. But I also was willing to focus on this topic tonight because I want, would be launching a discussion, not attempting to have the final word. This should not be a topic for Americans to discuss simply among themselves. For a day and a half in one of our rooms, some of you will have the opportunity to listen in on an international conversation about the issues involved with presenters from Malawi, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Ghana, and the DRC. The issues are not easy, and we will not resolve them in one weekend but a community of theological and missiological scholars jointly working and conversing together has a unique role to play in helping move the church forward in considering its pastoral role in the world today, given the issues involved. And we have uh, time for 
more time than I was hoping for. <laughs> <laughs>